Oh, Erica, Laura, we'll get back to you. Awesome. <laughs> week. <laughs> in the in the week, did you say? Yeah, week week. Uh, awesome. She she's gonna she's gonna contact them first, and then and then contact you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you guys for joining uh, the Peaceful Parenting Meetup. Uh, this is <clears throat> really exciting for me. Um, I have a five-month-old, so this is heavily on my mind. And uh, what better way to um, organize and process information than to share it with others? So I'm, I'm really happy that uh, others showed up so that we 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 have this <clears throat> um we're just going to start off with introductions uh name um <clears throat> you're probably where you're where you're located at and like describe your family um unit like uh what what where are you currently in the whole parenting paradigm um and then go ahead and like answer what does peaceful parenting mean to you? Um, you might know a little bit, you might know a lot, you might not know anything. So just want to get a gauge on where everybody's at. Um, Julia, would you like to, to start? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Julia, are you with us? <laughs> you want to unmute yourself and uh, give give an introduction of uh, name, what your family uh, currently is right now, and uh, what what do you think is par peaceful parenting to you? Yeah, I have two daughters. I have a twelve year old and a seven year old. Cool, cool. Do you, do you have any conception of what peaceful parenting means other than the two words put together? No. Sweet. Awesome. Thanks. Erica, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Hi, guys. Um, Erica and uh, where am I? I am uh, growing a baby inside of me. So that's my parenting. <laughs> Um, and I would love to um, just kind of like start getting ready for like what, yeah, what's going on, what's going to happen when the baby arrives, and it's not about the pregnancy only. So awesome. I think the hard part is coming. So I <laughs> and uh, how far along are you? We are 18 weeks and a few days. It's going to be 19 feet this week. Woohoo! <laughs> Exciting. All right, thanks. How do, I, how do I mute this, Josh? Are you on your phone? Yeah. Um, is there three three buttons that pop up if you touch the screen? Or yeah. Should be able to check in there. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Minta, you want to give a short hello and then we'll circle around and, and get deeper. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, it's nice to meet you both. My name is Minta, and um, I am a yoga teacher in the community, and I am a kids yoga teacher, which is, you know, a big part of my relationship with children, but I'm also expecting, Erica, so I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm about um, I think 15 weeks now, and, um, and I also have a little bit of experience teaching preschool, and so I'm going to dive a little deeper into some of those philosophies and its correlation to peaceful parenting as we go along. But yeah, I just, I live in kind of downtown Bellingham, close to that. And yeah, really happy to be a part of this. Um, yeah, I've had a really strong job, draw to working with children for the fascination of it, as well as knowing I was going to be a mother one day and now really wanting to take that in. So yeah, it's very real now. And <laughs> this is a surprise. So <laughs> it's very, very real. 
<laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> well, my name is Joshua. As I said, I have uh, I have a five-month-old and a 20-year-old. So I'm experiencing both ends of the spectrum right now. I just helped my daughter move, my 20-year-old daughter move into uh, her own house. Um, she's in school and that whole big thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a trip to be helping this young adult and then to be helping this, this baby uh, change her diaper. <clears throat> um, for me, peaceful parenting, uh, it's, it's really something that jumped out to me recently because um, my involvement with nonviolent communication, uh, I'm a organizer for the local uh, NBC Whatcom, and we put on study groups and, and events to help foster uh, connection and um, our ability to be able to compassionately communicate with one another. So sliding right into parenthood, this was just a perfect um, step into the direction of that I've already started to choose to live by and being able to reflect on my childhood uh, and with the new tools that I have, I now want to um, put those tools to work with with my children. So this is kind of this is what brought this meetup. Um, I, I looked looked around and didn't see anything exactly like this in uh, our local area. So I figured just gotta just gotta start it and build it. <clears throat> my uh, long term goal is to really create a network of parents that have similar. Uh, mindsets and philosophies and, and goals to uh, be able to help support uh, my kids as they grow up and, and to be able to support each other. So um, I just wanted to start with a very basic definition of what peaceful parenting is. Um, you can go online and there's tons of resources and, and I really found this simple definition um, a great starting point. <clears throat> so obviously, peaceful means nonviolent. So it's uh, avoiding uh, punitive. Um, I, have, I have a great. Uh, so it's exploring tools and choices to transition into a non-punitive, connection-based parenting approach. That's in the about section of the the meetup. And what that really means in, in layman's terms is to avoid saying as a parent, because I said so. <clears throat> uh, instead of saying because I said so and using your authority to, to get the desired behavior that you want, you, you take the time to uh, communicate, connect, and to negotiate with your child on um, finding win-win outcomes. And so it requires a lot of effort and a lot of a uh, lot more energy, but I myself have a, a very clear memory of my childhood when uh, my mother doing the best that she could uh, use that be because I said so, and it was, I was becoming a teenager and being able to ration, uh, use, use reason with my mind. And that answer did not give me the, uh, the understanding that I was looking for. And it really made me upset. And ultimately, uh, it led me in the direction of getting uh, kicked out of my house when I was 16, just because I was very unhappy with the. The, the circumstances. <clears throat> so um, I'll just kind of open this up and see if anyone else has uh, any stories or experiences with their parents because they said so. Erica? <laughs> So I grew up with a, a parent, my dad, who was um, an alcoholic, and um, it was um, 
it was really uh, confusing for me uh, to be surrounded with, uh, with like him telling me to do certain things and him not following it. So it's kind of like, yeah, you do that because I said so and I think it's going to be good for you, but I am not going to follow that. So it kind of felt, I felt confused and rebellious in that sense, but I, it just was kind of critical. So I was quite, um, I, I reacted to it quite often by like being um, quite verbal about it and rebe rebellious against them, like what they wanted to achieve because there was no connection. So that was kind of my story. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed and I would like to not to go that way with my child. What I know from my past, how I was brought up by my father, I would like to, you know, I would like to um, consciously change that somehow. And I know that it will probably come in times out, just kind of unconsciously, you know. So that's why I'm interested in this. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Minta, do you have a, a story like that? Yeah, um, mine particularly came from my uncle. I mean, my father and I have all sorts of stuff that we can go into further, but uh, it was my uncle and I was a grown adult and uh, I was, yeah, let's say I was um, 20, 21 or 22. And my grandmother had just died, and her home that we spent a lot of time with in Southern California was was a home to our whole family. And we knew that it had to be sold, or you know, it was going to get torn down um, after her passing. And I was there staying with them and helping to staying with my mom, their daughter, and helping to uh, clean out all of her things and go through all of her things, and just this really tragic and traumatizing process in of itself and trying to kind of soak in the last few moments that I had in this home. And uh, I, had, I had my own apartment in Los Angeles and was, you know, living a self-sustaining life. Um, and my uncle, who uh, that generation, because of the way they, they ran things, as soon as my grandfather had died, my uncle became the primary on all of my grandmother's finances and assets because he was a male. So she, no matter if she was still living, she wasn't allowed to, you know, have, an own, have a say in her own things. It had to involve a male. So that was an interesting component. And so he sat down with me um, because he told me I needed to get out of the house and that I wasn't allowed to stay there. And I tried so hard to have a conversation with him, to reason with him, to understand why he didn't see my value in spending you know, a couple weeks there helping to clean and organize and, and move everything out as, um, you know, and, and, and like my, my way of saying farewell to that whole experience in my life. And his words were because I said so. He couldn't say anything more than that. And here I was a grown adult. Like, you know, it, to some degree, I didn't expect it. But I saw the way that it happened with my father as a kid. Because he, he saw a superiority thing because he was an adult and I was a child. But in this scenario, it was an older man. Of course, it was my uncle. But it was just mind-blowing to me that he couldn't, um, he couldn't say anything else. He couldn't give me, um, you know, logical reasons, um, emotional reasons, any reasons that uh, were anything other than because I said so. And I was just infuriated and I like screamed at him saying, I do hear your the own words coming out of your mouth. Like, that's all you can say to me? Like, how can you stand feeling good about yourself and about what your choices are and what you're doing, doing to me? and my mother and our family and yeah so i yeah <laughs> and then i you know i've heard some of my friends and such like non um they don't mean to sound ignorant say like but you know sometimes you just gotta you gotta say something as a parent like that's your because i see you gotta clean your room because i said so and i'm like mm, i don't know if you ever have to say that like you know you can have a different kind of conversation with your kid about cleaning their room that doesn't have to be because I said so. And that's, yeah. that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, wow, wow. Powerful. powerful. 
Julia, do you have any any uh, stories you'd like to share? No, not really. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> do, do you, uh, we'll, we'll pause that idea. So my, my story, uh, I was, yeah, like I said, with my mom and uh, she, she was doing the best she could, but I grew up with that because I said so. And once I developed my my reasoning mind, like that that answer just didn't cut it anymore. And and I remember this this disagreement, this argument, very distinctly of because I said so, and I and I just kept saying why, because I said so, why, because I said so, why, and it just like blew up. And uh, and that was again like the result. All every time the end equation of that is disconnection. You're 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 closing the book on exploring this further, and um, when our relationship with our kids is one of the closest relationships that we have as human beings, to continuously close that door on that will have huge drastic effects. <clears throat> so. Um, in upcoming uh, in upcoming meetups, I'm going to be planning on doing this once a month. Um, I plan on having uh, different types of hosts joining us uh, to be able to share their knowledge. Um, this this next one is going to be uh, with Alan Side, who is a local M MVC practitioner. And at the end of this month, he's actually uh, on the 22nd doing a parenting uh, workshop that's going to be about eight hours long. Um, and I can, I'll provide the link um, after after this video to that. <clears throat> and uh, he'll be joining us next month to, to kind of share the, the NVC model and how that can be applied to raising our kids. Um, <clears throat> While uh, preparing for this meetup today, uh, I came across a, a great article on just explaining um, some a basic framework for um, what peaceful parenting is. Because as I said, like at, to, it was it was quite complex to try and like hone in on exactly a simple definition of that nonviolent and uh, the the choice to avoid because I say so. <clears throat> and once you can grasp and understand that, then we can add all these different components onto what peaceful parenting um, <clears throat> uh, means because there's tons of tools and tons of strategies out there on uh, what can be under the peaceful parenting umbrella. And it's gonna be different how that actually works with each household and with with each each type of relationship uh, some with older kids uh, some with young younger kids some things will work with others and some things uh, won't with 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 others so um, this article is from psycho uh, psychology today and was written by uh, Laura Markheim Markham Markham and she goes through like the 12, 12 uh, aspects of what peaceful parenting involves. And the first step is to start with yourself. Um, I'm already experiencing this, but oftentimes when we go through uh, like a rocky experience with our kids, afterwards, there can be a lot of guilt and shame on how we handled that situation. Thinking like, oh, I should have done this. I wish I did this. It totally might have worked out differently if I would have kept my cool. Um, and the first really step with peaceful parenting is to uh, start with yourself and bring that peace uh, within yourself and just know that this is an ongoing process to be able to um, use consciousness 
to not react to a situation, but to choose to uh, remain curious and explore the situation. <clears throat> Minta, do you have any good tips on how to really um, forgive yourself and to uh, work on like remaining peaceful internally so that you can then respond uh, externally? Yeah, I actually was talking about a theme in my uh, classes this week that really resonates with this well. And it was the idea of um, differentiating self-judgment and self-responsibility. So being able to honestly reflect upon what happened is taking self-responsibility telling yourself you're bad, you're a failure, you suck, you effed up is, uh, is self-judgment and uh, blame. And, and it would, I, I play with those two concepts all the time because I'm all about responsibility and self-responsibility. Uh, I'm also insanely about self-love and that's what the Embody Love Movement is and self-forgiveness and, and the only way to love is to start with acceptance and the only way to get to acceptance is to start with forgiveness. So it, like forgiveness is the leader to acceptance and to love. You can't reach those two platforms unless you start with forgiveness. You can't just go, I'm not going to face that and then I'm going to go accept and love myself and my child. Like It has to be with, ooh, I did my best. I can release that. I can see it. I can forgive myself. Um, and, uh, and I think that you know, that's going to be necessary, especially when you feel that self-judgment and self-criticism arrive. Ultimately, if you can get to that place of um, self-responsibility first and like kind of stop the self-judgment, like notice it coming in and just be like, okay, no, 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 no. I mean, I did it in class after I taught the lesson. I would, they were resting in Shavasana and I had this big singing bowl and I like picked up the wand that you, you know, ding the bowl with. And I turned to look at the clock to make sure I was at the right time. The sun blinded me and I was just like, dang <laughs> Everyone's resting in Shavasana. The last thing you want to do is like wake them up, you know, or you know, startle them. And I was like, oh, I could immediately go, oh my God, you suck as a yoga teacher. You should feel awful about that. Everyone's going to remember that. This is this, you know, it was just this perfect opportunity to be like, you know what? Like, that's exactly what I'm teaching right now. It's like, okay, you know, maybe next time I don't hold the wand while I look to the clock <laughs> and fly by the sun. And I can learn from that experience, but it doesn't have to turn me into a bad person. Um, and I think that that is what then we just start to shed the weight of shame and, um, and yeah, blame of it towards ourselves. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, using the situation for uh, an immediate feedback. So... Uh, a great example of this is a boxer. Uh, when they go into the ring <clears throat> and they start boxing with another individual, that situation is a, is a perfect feedback loop of of if if he goes in there and and does the wrong thing or doesn't perform at his best, he's going to immediately get a response uh, based upon his performance. And if he uh, afterwards is super down on himself or says like, I should have done this or I should have done that. And uh, like it, he would never get back into the, into the ring, but because of their mentality, they use every failure to as a learning experience and to grow of like, Oh, thanks for pointing out that weak spot. Now I get to tune in or refine my process to become even better. And so I think the process is the same thing with a parent of uh, being accountable with, with, with all the situations that you're experiencing, but then like learn from it. Like it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be a process that we both get to learn from. <clears throat> uh, Julia, Erica, feel free to jump in if you have anything that you'd like to add uh, to any, any of these topics. So um, the second second uh, tip of 
this article is called, it's focusing on connecting. And positive parenting doesn't work without connection because you squander your only leverage and you have to resort to threats, <clears throat> which destroys trust and start your child acting out again. So before you change anything else with your child, start building up your bond. Otherwise, you'll drop your punishment. But your child still won't feel motivated to do right, and you'll, and you'll see uh, more testing behavior. So start spending at least 15 minutes connecting one-on-one -on -one with your child daily, just following the, their lead and pouring your love into him. You'll be amazed at the difference in the way that they respond to your requests. Uh, Laura, my wife, uh, she just mentioned this last night, and, and I totally experienced the same thing, that we, we both work at home, and so we're constantly trying to juggle working with uh, giving our five-month-old everything that she needs. And <clears throat> I get busy with my to-do list and my thinking mind, and I'm like, oh, baby's crying, okay, run over there, do-do-do, here's a toy. Here's, here's something and then run back into my room, start working again. And oftentimes that isn't enough for her. And so she'll start like building up in intensity until boom, she blows up. And then I'm like, okay, I have to completely stop what I'm doing to go and tend to her and, and give her some attention. And uh, this is exactly what this is talking about. My, and Laura said yesterday, she's like, you know what, when I finally just like stop what I'm doing and give my full attention to Araya, our daughter, then like everything else melts away. Like stop thinking about your phone, your commitments and things to do. And you're able to then like create this like beautiful bond. And it, it's a lot of fun. And like the world melts away around you. And the, the difference in Araya's response to that is huge to where she's like super happy and uh, uh, like she's really in a state of joy, which just mirrors my own emotions to, to feeling that as well. And so <clears throat> not trying to like do both of like, okay, I'm going to try and work and then like, okay, give the baby something to play with, but, but to be able to really like tune in and give her your full attention totally de-escalates her own, um, her own need for attention. And it's, it's such an immediate feedback when I don't give her attention and see that continuous escalation into a, a blow up. Minta, do you have any uh, good connection tips? Yeah, I love that. I, I particularly love that they say uh, 15 minutes a day because it kind of gives you something like really tangible to work with because I know exactly what you're talking about in regards to my three nieces. So I don't have it with my everyday child yet. But um, we have, when I have my three nieces with me, particularly this last 10 days, the last summer, they're seven, nine and 11 now. And I was newly pregnant, and I had all three nieces with me, and I felt like a real mom because I was dealing with morning sickness and had these three little girls to make three meals a day for, pack lunches for. And I just found myself way more like on edge, exhausted, like dealing with all these other layers of myself that I would go kind of the quick answer like Josh was doing, where it's just like, what do you need? What do you need real quick, like to satisfy what they need? Kind of like so I could go lay back down or focus on something else that I had to do for them because the list just felt endless. And it, it felt draining to me at the end of the day. It was like I missed them. I didn't feel like I was my authentic self. I, you know, I felt like I kind of had to be in that role during that time. So there was a lot of self-forgiveness because I was dealing with a lot of new stuff for me. But, um, but I just love that there's a time suggested there, the 15 minutes. I think that that's so powerful because then it's not like, oh, I gotta be the perfect parent all day long where every time I engage with my child, I'm looking them directly in the eyes and we have this beautiful moment whenever they need a little tea thing. Like it allows you to kind of do those running around stuff when you have to and also commit to those 15 minutes and let that be like what fills 
the, um, the, the pot, the kid parent pot. And then there's the, you know, partner pot and there's the work pot or whatever, you know, it's like that helps to fill that one. Um, yeah. So I really appreciate that. And I, and I obviously being a yoga teacher connection is the number one most important thing. Like feeling like a relatability between two people, whether it's a child and a parent or anyone, it's the most important piece. So I love that that's in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, and and for me, like I'm such a I'm a, I'm a workaholic, and so I love accomplishing my my tasks. And it doesn't like from a from a rational mind. <clears throat> if I'm trying to write an email and the baby starts fussing, and I'm like, okay, 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 let me just just let me try and finish what I'm doing before I can give you my attention. <clears throat> it actually takes longer because I'm like over here. I'm over here, I'm over here, then it would be to like give them that, that 15 minutes and then boom, they're ready for a nap or they're totally content by themselves where I can then fully focus on my work. So I know that it's, it's making my, 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 my productivity and probably the quality too lower by trying to like do what I want before what their needs are. And Josh, I just want to add one more thing. This reminds me so much of every relationship. <laughs> I mean, if you think about like my partner and I, it's my closest relationship before this child. And it's like, you know, I see him juggling the work and the, you know, time with me and, and time with family or like his other layers that he has to focus on. And when he's in that juggling mode, nothing gets done. And I tell him, I'm like, you can just say, I'm going to come over for five minutes for like a hug and a kiss. What that does for me for the next like seven hours <laughs> insane like you know rather than oh maybe I you know I can kind of be doing all of them at once and I can bounce around so it's just so it's the exact same thing with connection with anyone yes yeah. So, yeah yeah I like that yeah uh Julia you're kind of the one with the most experience out of all of us with kids like how, how do you do it and uh like do you notice the the difference in what we're talking about yeah, I, I definitely connect here to filling the pot because I feel like whenever we have our most conflict is, is when the kids need some of our attention. And if we don't fill that bucket every day, then that's when, you know, especially the teenager, just it's hard to make that connection and not to be like, you know, do what I said or there's just a lot more conflict. So, you know, that's, that's a really great suggestion. Awesome. <clears throat> Yeah, so the next, thanks for sharing that. Uh, the next uh, suggestion is explain what's happening. Once you see more connection and cooperation, then initiate a discussion. And this one is going to be probably a whole uh, meetup in itself. Um, next time that we uh, have this, next month, we'll have Alan side with us and, and um, his communication skills are just uh, top notch. And so he has two daughters. Uh, I think there are three, three kids, I think ranging from eight to uh, 13, 14, I think. And so he's really getting his communication skills put to the test with his teenagers. So we'll, uh, we'll circle back around uh, in how to create better connection with that. And right now we have uh, Kara joining us. Hi, Kara. Hi, welcome. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. We'll do a a, a quick little intro. Uh, we all started off with saying uh, our names, uh, what your current family unit is like, and then uh, what what definition do you have for peaceful parenting? Mm. Well, my name is Kara. Um, I am. I got married a little over a year ago, and I am working towards becoming a mother. I haven't started a family yet, but it's something that my husband and I aspire to do. And uh, peaceful parenting to me really revolves a lot around autonomy and being able to help guide a young individual to becoming in a free autonomous being. Awesome. Nice answer. 
<clears throat> so uh, we went around and shared some stories from our past. Uh, because I, I started off with giving a very basic definition of what peaceful parenting is. One, obviously, it's a, a nonviolent approach to parenting. But two, also that it's um, working towards avoiding saying because I say so and using your authority to uh, get your way. And so do you have any um, stories from your past where your parents or or some authority figures t said because i said so plenty yes <laughs> uh definitely and i was in a really polarized household of um two different types of, of parents and they did when i was about 10 years old they split and so i had two different households but um my mother especially was one of very much the mother knows best and you know a lot of that yes because I said so. Um, I can't single out a specific memory just because I feel like there's so many of them there. Yeah. <clears throat> me me too. I was I was definitely raised with with that phrase constantly used. And it worked it worked until uh, until I started thinking for myself and then and then it caused some trouble. So just for uh, some housekeeping, uh, feel free to just mute your microphone while uh, while we're going through this. And then if you have something to say, uh, feel free to un un unmute yourself. So uh, we've been going through an article that I found that I'm going to share into the group afterwards on uh, 12 tips to transition to par peaceful parenting. Uh, first one was to start with yourself. Uh, the peace and peaceful parenting comes from you. So being able to uh, process and regulate your own emotions um, and, and being able to like identify and check in with yourself so that you're not blowing up on those around you. The second tip was to focus on connecting and Minta gave some really great um, tools and tips on how to be able to stay accountable with yourself and to create connection with your with your kids and this is a real light introduction um, to this topic because uh, each of these I'm sure is going to be able to get um, their own um, future meetup on how to uh, have more tools to explore these things number three is explain what's happening and that's uh, being able to communicate and uh, negotiate with your kids and again that one's going to be a full full meetup um, number four ask for cooperation <clears throat> the suggestion here was we still have all the same rules our most important rule is that in this house we treat each other with kindness um, I'm going to work very hard not to yell at you and and to listen and to listen and be kind so obviously peaceful parenting involves uh, nonviolence and um i kind of like the the definition of there uh, are no uh peaceful parenting involves rules but no rulers so uh the rules in, include um like no, no no violence and if there is threat of violence or or the the beginning of initiating violence that there's strict action to 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 stop that and to um, be able to um, make sure that everyone's safety is being met. So <clears throat> having these uh, firm rules that your kids know about and that they've previously agreed to, then when you are asking for cooperation in this in the situation, that uh, they they're aware of this and you can use this. If, 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 if your kid's at the playground and gets upset and, and lashes out at another kid, you can then talk about this afterwards. First, like take care of the situation, make sure everybody's, safe, everybody's need for safety is being met. That means breaking them up or what so. Uh, but then to connect with them and talk about what was going on and, and don't just say that they're in trouble because they hit another kid, but 
take the time to explore what was going on because <clears throat> oftentimes if the kid is punished because they attacked another kid and and they get punished because of that then then what they learn is they're going to get punished for 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 hitting another kid and <clears throat> They don't learn why the need for safety is important. They just learn that if they hit another kid while there's adults around, then there's going to be the consequence of the adult hitting the kid, which to me, that's uh, that behavior just creates more of the same behavior. If the kid learns that hitting a kid uh, results in a bigger authority hitting them, then they're going to continue with that mind mindset uh, as they grow and develop, and they'll either start hiding the situation from from the parents to avoid the punishment, but they won't they won't learn um, with their own mind why that need for safety is important amongst everybody. And asking for cooperation is within that framework of like understanding, like okay, everybody has their need for safety, and so. Uh, how do we all cooperate with one another without the need for physical violence? Minta? Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, it's like what they don't learn, like I feel like what you're even getting out there for a minute too is like they don't learn empathy and they don't learn compassion. They don't, under, they don't learn the relationship between them and that child. They just learn the action and what happens when that action happens. So I like that explanation. Um, and this is just a suggestion, like for us as adults with verbiage, and this is just from my experience as a facilitator, but primarily as a um, children yoga teacher, actually the combination of both, because when you're facilitating an experience for other people's emotions, and it's not at all about you, and you want to simply allow space for other people to feel courageous enough to confront their own stuff and bring their own stuff forward, as well as to have like children on your side. So that's my kids yoga thing is like to have kids on your side and then to have adults from that experience, you know, and children, because I facilitate with both adults and children to, you know, feel safe to come forward with like what's really going on with them. We love to use the word agreements over rules just because rules has been affiliated so much with like, I'm going to give you a backhand if you don't follow the rules and rules have been, you know, like your, your school marm is giving you rules and the principal gets you in trouble when you break the rules and that the word rule has just been associated with so much of that kind of negative intensity and I do believe it needs to be like redefined because it, it, it can be in this context it's a really important thing mm -hmm. like I love what it's saying here is like and what you said too about like you know create these rules together and so I would just say create these agreements together because it just gets like an immediate buy-in like that's the word that I would use to be like okay what do we need as a family to, um, you know, make sure that we're, we're all getting our needs met or whatever, you know, however you phrase that, um, you know, and treated kindly, like, what, what do we need? Because that's kind of how I start my workshops is like, you know, what, what do you need from me? What do you need from yourself? What do you need from the group to, um, you know, possibly allow yourself to feel vulnerable? You know, that would be something in like the workshop setting. Um, to share stories about your truth and your experience. Uh, and then everybody's voice is heard and you're making the list together. And then it's like this agreement process. And of course, and then when they don't come up with the agreements on their own that you want them to have, like there's a very important ones that the kid's not going to say, you use questions to help them come up with it. So they still come up with it. Like, you know, what might it be like if I walked over to you and I smacked you, you know, or something like, how might that make you feel? No hitting, you know, and then you might go, okay, let's call it nonviolent. Like you could find your way of like, but then their voice is a part of uncovering that. 
Um, and just, you know, from my little experience as a new, in the new parent role, um, but at, with, with those other experiences in my life, it just, it's that natural buy-in of like, we made these agreements together on the wall here, um, you know, we committed to them together, and uh, yeah, there's just something beautiful in that process. So just as a little planting, yeah. if, if you like that word, whatever. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Erica? Can I actually maybe add to it? Yeah. I think it also, thanks Minta, because I think that what really allows everybody to be responsible for also their commitment, what they're committing to agreeing. So it's like self-responsibility in that sense, you know, like um, that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> so I really like that. I like the, uh, you know, rather than rules, let's come up together with something we can both be happy with and we can both achieve what we need you know the space for safety the space for um i don't know um a beauty in the household together you know to clean up our after cells or something like that so yeah beautiful yeah, thanks. Thanks for catching that, because it's such a it's a word, and and the difference between rule and agreement is completely uh, vast, and and it's easy because we were raised with these kind of words and these kind of ways of thinking that uh, it's so easy to resort back into just what we know. A good litmus litmus test that I've learned about for uh, peaceful parenting and is would and then this is great for any situation when you're when you're dealing with your kids is would uh would you talk the same way to a roommate as you are to your kid right now <clears throat> and 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 it fits with this of uh of rules like well you know the rules and like think of your partner or think of a roommate some adult and being like like how how would they react? They'd probably want to rebel. Uh, I know I would if I if I got rules thrown at me. But if you were to use agreements, like as a as this is it's such an inclusive uh, word to use that a they've previously given their word, so this is a part of their integrity. Uh, that's that 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 that's why this needs to be be maintained, not because we said so. <clears throat> so the next uh, tip on peaceful parenting is offer support and model win-win solutions. Nonviolent communication really taught me about the opportunity for win-win outcomes and uh, the difference between what a compromise is and what a win-win solution is. And through these steps of peaceful parenting, as 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 they were already laid out, you're you're checking in with yourself, uh, working towards inner peace, and then connecting with the child. And so the natural outcome to each situation would be to head in the direction of a win-win. How can your needs be met, and how could my needs be met uh, in any sort of circumstance? And <clears throat> The big difference between that and compromise is basic compromise is like, well, some of your needs aren't going to be met and some of my needs aren't going to be met. And this is the outcome that uh, we're going to um, end up on where if you compound those one on those one after another in a relationship, it's going to result in both of your needs ultimately not being met. So nonviolent communication directs us towards win-win outcomes where you just continue to stay curious and continue to, to look for the best possible solution in any scenario to get both needs met. Anybody have anything to add to that? It's the hardest stuff to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, that has been the, the biggest challenge I have uh, I have faced, I think, uh, through nonviolent communication, just coming up with, um, yeah, with these strategies which are going to work for both of us. And I'm not talking about the relationship. Um, 
where you know and then i i guess again there is that self-responsibility which comes into place to just stand behind our needs what do i need in this and um keep you know keep bringing back keep going back to it and being curious how if my needs are getting fulfilled or if i'm just settling or you know just like what you said compromising so but i can only imagine like would the with the children, that would be, that would be really kind of like it would change, right? Like each each age group would be different. Like when they are infants, it's very different compared to toddler, or you know, or when they are able to like process, and now they're having their own thinking, and you know, they're becoming these um, you know first graders. So um, how do you? How do you get them to talk about, like, you know, how do you know? Like, because we can only imagine what the, I mean, we can only see what infant needs, but let's say toddler, like, what do they need? Like, because they're not able to construct the sentences. We can only imagine or, you know, that's kind of a challenge when it comes to children mm -hmm. and doing it with somebody who is not able to express fully what they need. Yeah, so that's kind of my my question. Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm experiencing that right now with my five month old, and right off the bat, like weeks into this, uh, I was so surprised at the cues that they're actually were able to communicate with. Uh, right off the bat, they're either like crying or not crying. That's their cues, and and. Uh, you kind of have a list of like, is it a diaper? Is it food? Is it, uh, is it sleep? And so you kind of go through these and look for those, those yes, no outcomes. Um, <laughs> oh, actually, no, there's three. There's three um, emotions of a, of a child. There's crying, not crying, and about to cry. <laughs> and you try to get into like not crying as much as possible. Um, but just two days ago, my my five month old Araya, uh, she uh, we we always have this like nighttime routine, and it involves a yoga ball. And so for five months now, we I put put her in my arms in the yoga ball, put in her pacifier, start bouncing, and she immediately starts to like go into sleep mode. Um, <clears throat> but two nights two nights ago, did that same thing. Got on the ball, and she arches her back in defiance and starts 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 wailing. I'm like, okay, what's going on? What's different? And then uh, I ended up like taking her just on our bed, and then she like settled down into just fussiness. I'm mean, like, okay, and I was trying to feed her, and uh, <clears throat> and 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 then. She was fussy, and then I went back to the ball thinking, like, okay, maybe, we like, we can move into the sleepy process of the ball. Got on, back on the ball, again, boom, arch back, and she just started going nuclear on me. And I'm like, whoa, this is totally different. This is it's her nighttime routine. It's, like, same time, same, same behavior, like, same, same uh, process. And so then I got up, and, like, tuning in like obviously that's not what she wants and so i brought her over to her crib and laid her down and then she started smiling and i was like what okay and i like slowly like started backing up <laughs> away from the crib and what's what's hilarious about this just just earlier that day i was talking about uh like moving towards like being able to just set her in the crib and like let her self get put to sleep uh i was reading in a, in a book it said usually it takes like 15 minutes of being fussy and they'll they'll start to put themselves to sleep so <clears throat> it was fascinating i think she overheard me talking about it uh but it was fascinating to like get those cues of like okay this is not what you want and and then being able to to respond to that and so it's, it's amazing how early that communication starts coming in uh, of being able to like tune in on what their needs are. So uh, next one in this article is expect emotions. 
And emotions is something that I have really worked diligent on with being able to come to terms and identify what's going on inside of me. Gosh, did we did we miss keep setting limits? I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on on purpose. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so expect emotions means uh, just like what I was dealing with with my daughter uh, that things are going to get messy. Things are going to get uncomfortable. Things are going to get really stressful and. Those first few months of, of bringing a child into the world is extremely stressful. And it really put the relationship with my partner to the test uh, just because lack of sleep, uh, complete disruption in your, in your life, uh, and then trying to like decipher the needs of this crying baby uh emotions get brought up not only just in the in your child but especially within yourself within your partner um and and having tools to be able to identify and process that is is probably one of the biggest um probably one of the biggest like tools that you need to uh get better at in order to have all these strategies available to you because if if you can't process your own emotions you definitely are going to have a hard time processing your child's emotions and that sense of connection is going to suffer from that and we have any uh, suggestions on emotional processing i mean it, to me it brings up the um the idea of emotional boundaries um because that's a, that's a big thing for me uh my my past my mom she really didn't um they, she was you know kind of just lived really passed on that um dependent lifestyle of just like really like when she saw us in pain or needing something she immediately went to a fixing mode like had to fix it or it was buying something or, or calling you know she was doing the work and i ended up um i ended up avoiding telling her the truth about what was going on with me whenever i was hurt or or struggling because i didn't want her to try to fix my problems i just wanted to be able to share my feelings with her like mommy and daughter um and i saw her fixing my brother's problems all the time and so I was like, I'm, I don't need her to carry my weight, so I'm going to step back. I'm not even going to tell her my feelings anymore. And then through my work with, um, you know, in body love movement, facilitation, uh, and yoga teaching, it's been a lot about emotional boundaries. And basically the idea behind it is like knowing when my emotions end and someone else's begin, know when theirs end and mine begin. Um, and I used to suffer a lot in my relationships, my intimate relationships, I think particularly because of that influence from my mother, um, that like, you know, when, that when I was hurt, they were so upset and if they were upset, I could not get over this, you know, if they were upset, I was all mixed, mixed up and couldn't, um, get clear with myself. And uh, I think it's just that perfect example of that, um, because I think we learn how to we subliminally learn how to be parents with other adults because we're all just um, larger children uh, and, uh, at the end of the day. And, uh, and so I think that that's just so key is like being able to step back, back. And I think that that's that empathy thing too, is just, um, you know, to, to, you know, you're, I, I remember being a teenager that said, you know, fuck you, you know, I hate you, like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And so it's like, I feel like I've been mentally and emotionally preparing my whole life or since I was a teenager for the time when a child acts like that to me. And I had a roommate in Arizona who's a teenager and or actually middle schooler, like 11 and 12 year old just screamed at her face, you know, fuck you, I hate you, I wish you weren't my mom, and she was a wonderful person, and her daughter and her had a strong relationship, and her son uh, reacted that way to her, and she would sob at night, and I would sit with her, and it was just like that reminder, I mean, you've got to 
we have to be able to allow them to have their separate experience and not take it personally. And that kind of comes back to the five agreements, which is such a profound thing too. Um, you know, like allow them to have their emotions. And this is something I'm still practicing every day in my intimate relationships and allow yourself to have your own emotions understand that they come from entirely different places um you know and i think that that creates the space to uh to then examine how you're gonna you know move forward in a situation and really just being able to separate emotion um is is the key because once you're all intertwined into one it's math yeah, it's madness yeah <laughs> it is there, there's so much to be said to that and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be circling around into deeper aspects of uh, how to do that and tools to be able to know where I end and you begin because it's, it's crucial to be able to identify and process emotions because you can't process someone else's emotions. So if, if you don't know what's, what's yours to be responsible for, then uh, it, can, it can really yeah stay messy. Um, so next up in this article is uh, create safety and we kind of touched on that previously just about uh, everyone's innate need for safety and how do we um, maintain that and I, I, I hope my, my goal is to uh, raise my daughter in a nonviolent way and so by limiting uh violence in her environment she's going to just naturally become a nonviolent person and being able to uh, process and um be able to take care of herself uh and her needs so that she never acts out in violence uh, i don't know what the reality is going to be about this uh, i'm sure other parents have had difficulty in this uh, area so we'll probably have to circle back around um, to this topic. Um, the next one in this is help your child make sense of their experience with a story. Uh, just from other avenues of my life, storytelling I know is so powerful to be able to take an, uh, an experience, turn it into a, a story so that your kids can um, understand in a much more simpler way uh, and and it, it just really hits home. Minta, do you have a lot of experience with storytelling in your classes or uh, during yoga for kids? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, it's the, well, for me, it's uh, the way it shows up in my life is that through sharing story through, through sharing your story um through you know whenever i go into facilitation for embody love movement it always starts with me um sharing why i showed up to be in that seat and kind of telling a little story about why uh, or just about myself but also one that exposes kind of the imperfections the challenges the um vulnerability and what it does for me in that scenario and what I understand it and witness it to do is it creates, it allows space for other people to experience those same feelings and things within themselves. And, um, and that's, the, so whenever I go into the role of teaching, I always try and use that. Like if I'm going to teach a concept about yoga or teaching from the philosophy I'm going to find a very personal story that that showed up in my life and share that with the group because I know that that piece is going to be what sticks, what resonates, and um, and ultimately at the end of the day, it's creating connection because it allows them to see me as a human, an equal human, and gives them permission to, to have that equal experience themselves in their own unique way. So, um, yeah, I would say that that to me is, um, is the best form of story is just kind of like explaining your, you know, emotional experience, explaining, you know, things that went through you. I'm a big letter writer when it comes to like challenging emotions with partners or friends, because then I can write it out like 
story of my experience and then I started to feel this and then I noticed this happened and, and that just I feel like that comes through to people um so powerfully when we when we share things in that manner so um, yeah I highly encourage I think it's so important and if we're just telling people like you know you felt this way because of this or you need to do this because of that um, yeah, it's so insanely different than being like, so when I went through this experience, like I noticed this, I felt this, um, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and the way that that is retained, uh, is so extremely different than, uh, and I, I used to be very finger pointy, you know, and I started to notice I had four other fingers pointed back and <laughs> so it was a great opportunity to be like, okay. I actually can speak to this, not at you about it. Yeah, for sure. And uh, <clears throat> what came to mind during what you were saying was uh, something I heard called uh, narration, like live narration uh, for for your kids, for you to say out loud like what your process is throughout the day of like, oh, I, I just locked the keys inside of the car. And so you kind of talk out loud, like your process of like, oh, man, I'm, I'm really like upset with myself because I did that. But, you know, it was just an accident to, and to say these things out loud because the kids are just soaking it up, seeing like how you respond in any circumstance and, and to be able to get that live story of like what's going on. And they'll be able to pick up on that and, and mimic it. So uh, the next one in this article, we're plugging right along now. It's uh, number 10, uh, teach reparations. Uh, if you've been punishing your whole uh, parenting relationship, you'll feel unfinished if your child breaks a rule and you don't punish them. Mm. Uh, train yourself to think in terms of repair instead. So after everyone has calmed down and is feeling reconnected, have a private discussion with your child about what happened. Listen to their perspective and empathize. You were pretty mad when he did that. I hear you. Uh, <clears throat> and once he's passed his upset, so right there, uh, you're creating connection and empathy and they're being heard because you're mirroring back what it is that uh, they were experiencing. Once they get past being upset and the point, uh, you point out the damage. Uh, when you said that to your brother, it really hurt his feelings. I wonder if it made him not feel as close to you. <clears throat> so really like taking apart a scenario and exploring it afterwards on why, uh, <clears throat> why the outcome didn't turn out as, as, as well as it could have. And first, and first off, starting with tuning in with them and making sure that what their part of the experience uh, was is valid. Just like what you said, Minta, of once we are able to share what happened with us being a part of that, like it's, it's true for you, like no matter what happens. So you're not assuming what took place. You're not making judgments. You're not jumping to conclusions, you get to check in with each person in the scenario to, to let them be heard, which is usually the, the uh, first step in conflict is, is misunderstandings. And so you're able to bring that up to the table, make, let both people know uh, both sides of the story, and then work towards uh, a peaceful outcome from that so that uh, Again, it can be a learning process instead of uh, a, a blowout that, that constantly takes place because of misconnection, miscommunication. Yeah, this also uh, reminds me of the, some of the work. So when I taught preschool, uh, we were the methodology that we used at the preschool I worked at was inspired by the European methodology called Reggio Emilia. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but um, it was really cool. So we didn't do everything exactly, but I knew that the, the teachings I was receiving from my co-teachers and the director of the school were inspired by that. And, um, you know, they were so incredible. Like a few of them real quick were just like, 
when you talk to a child, like get down to their eye level, never be looking down at them, like stand on your knees, be directly eye level with them. Um, you know, in regards to all of these other things we've touched on, like, you know, um, tell them that you see them. Like, I, I see you are really angry right now. Like they're kicking something or punching something or they're like, grabbing something really hard. I see that. I see that you're upset. Um, you know, especially if they don't have a lot of words, these were a lot of like two and a half, three year olds. And, um, and it was amazing when you used these methods that it was like, you just held magic in your hands, like the way that these children would respond it blew my mind. because I didn't have a lot of experience, even babysitting or anything. And, um, and I saw the way firsthand with really challenging children, um, as well, how this worked out. And one of them that kind of kind of, kind of touches upon what we're talking about right now was like we never asked a kid to say they were sorry if they hurt another child. We never asked that. And um, instead, we said, you know, ask your friend if they're okay. Like that would be our guidance. Like once we kind of talked to them and got through whatever was going on with them independently. We'd say, and we, you know, we we call them a friend if they were a friend, but like, you know, most of us we refer to each other as friends. They're two and a half, three year olds, so they play with each other and then they hit each other. And we'd say, you know, ask Evan or ask Carter, like, is he okay? Like, check. We oh, we use the term check in with them, check in with them, like what's going on with them. And like, so ninety nine percent of the time, it was so cute. It would be like they'd be like, are you okay? You know, they'd eventually say those words, and then the kid might go like yeah or no and then and then our next thing would go ask them what you can do and then the child you know it, what can i do or what do you need or they say something like that and a lot of times the kid would be like you know they either say it or we would suggest it we'd be like do you want a hug you know if we kind of knew the kid and then yeah i want a hug and then the kids would go over and hug so like would it sorry was like never in there but we got to witness this attempt to communicate um, over the situation. Are you okay? What do you need? It was a check-in. Um, it involved the other person. Uh, it was it was just so sweet. So that was a very cool experience I had that just kind of reminds me of some of this. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I totally grew up with, with say you're sorry. And like, what is that? Like, what does that really mean? It means that no matter your behavior, no matter like how bad you just acted, that if you say those two magic words, that it excuses everything that just took place. Like it really, really frustrating. Well, and then it's like you get the like, I would have the super like nasty kids in their nasty moments, you know, we'll just call them that for now, where they just be like, sorry, 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 sorry. And like, you know, with this really like attitude. And then I see that with adults all the time too. Like, I'm sorry, sorry. You know, they walk out the room and it's like, what does that mean? Like, we lost touch with how valuable that word is. And the word can be insanely valuable, but we've devalued the hell out of it. And it starts when we're like, so you're sorry to that person. And it's like, what was the point in that? I don't want it. I don't want to. Sorry. Sorry. You know, and that's the only thing being said in that scenario. Right. Yeah. yeah and it's I, want, I want to say it's, it's, um, can I just add to it? Like it, what I, I love Please. what you said, Lisa, because it almost what you went through, you were teaching children how to like communicate between them, but they didn't know how to get there yet. Like, you know what I mean? Like they didn't know that the strategy was maybe to give a hug or what they needed. They had to and you're like guiding them to it, gave them an idea. Oh, maybe these are my needs. Maybe I need a hug. Maybe I just uh, feel mad or frustrated or angry or like, do you know what I mean? So it gave them an idea to identify their their needs and their what they were going through. And it gave them a value. It validated them. Okay, these are my needs. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can feel sad or, you know, and I don't have to uh, hide it anymore because he is coming and asking me directly. But, but just by saying sorry, you know, I think that it's very true. I think we are taught how to react is by just saying, yeah, I'm sorry. And um, it doesn't 
unless we choose to go further and we really can say, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, like we can, we choose to elaborate on it. It's just the two empty words and teaching our children how to facilitate, you know, like a, a process to go through to actually acknowledge each other through the process, you know, and then uh, validate their feelings and the other person's feelings, you know, other child feelings. I think it's fascinating to know the process of facilitating this for children. That I want to know how. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. It, it, it's true. My my twenty year old daughter just popped in. Those are Laura's. Sure. <laughs> so the last one in this article is ex expect setbacks. Expect setbacks. It says you're human. You're right. You're not perfect. The secret of making this transition is having compassion for yourself, just as you do for your child. Uh, peaceful parenting i'm fully aware that it's going to be way more challenging than it would be to just spank my child or to say because i said so it requires a uh, constant connection communication negotiations uh with them and uh couple that with extreme situations of uh, being at a picnic and and experiencing a blowout and and or or wanting to give my attention to something else and the connection is required with my kid i know it's going to be a huge challenge for me to be able to maintain but my goal is to create a chain of trust through their lives and <clears throat> anytime that i resort back to either violence or saying, because I say so, I'm breaking that trust. And my goal is to have this beautiful, beautiful uh, relationship with my child and a deep level of connection that uh, she'll be able to model her other relationships with uh, in the future. So Minta, I'm sure in uh, Embody Love, you guys have a lot of good, um, forgiveness um, exercises on how to be kind to yourself because life's messy yeah yeah i know absolutely i mean it's it's i think the number one thing that has just well it's one word that really changed everything for me was the word practice was um viewing anything that we do in this life as a practice and not um, framing it any other way. I mean, I, I even, I'm partial to the words goals because I think that even for myself, goals kind of end up with a bit of pressure. Um, but a lot of people set goals and they can be a wonderful, great thing. So I don't want to down that word, but I just refer to everything as a practice. And by using the verbiage practice means that we do it every single day for the rest of our lives and there's no end result. And that in of itself allows you to like, like when you're practicing basketball, you're going to miss the hoop just as often as you might make it or whatever. That's just a part of practicing. You might get more and more tools in your toolbox when you're more, when you're practicing more often, you might be able to get that basket more often, but it's still a practice and it still has just as much of a chance of, um, of falling short than it does of succeeding. And so that word in itself just makes things, so that's what we word all the time on like when it comes to like loving yourself. Like self-love is like not something that you reach and you just, you win it. I love myself, I've done it, yay. It's like every single day, new parts of our past expose themselves. Our bodies are constantly changing. So if it's around body image or the way that you view yourself, your strengths are constantly changing. God forbid, as a freaking female, like after having a child or bearing a child, we're completely transforming. And you have to surrender this release of everything that you know and like completely rebuild yourself. So it has to come with that practice. Like it's just an everyday, like I'm gonna work with, I'm gonna recognize when my thoughts go to a judgmental place. I'm gonna recognize when they go to a critical place. And, um, 
you know, there's a tenderness. There's a like the 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 biggest thing that turned uh, the like comparison and um, body image and self love stuff around for me. It really came down to realizing I like to take responsibility. So for me personally, it was realizing that how I treat myself directly impacts how I treat everyone around me. So if I want to have like tenderness in the way that I show up to my friendships, if I want to have a sweetness, if I want to hold forgiveness, if I want to like, you know, just like have the softness to myself in love and relationships, I have to have that with myself. I have to be able to turn the lens around, look myself in the eyes and see myself as just as tender, as just as sweet, as just as vulnerable, as just as in need of soft, kind love. Um, and uh, one, uh, one, I don't know if you've probably heard of it, and I can't ever pronounce it right. It's like a hono oh, no, but oh, or something prayer. It's a Hawaiian prayer. And it goes, um, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. And if you start just saying those words, especially if you put a little song to it, and think about saying it to yourself, I mean, that simple. Like, you know, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. It's like recognizing the way that we show up every day, we might need to say those four, four phrases to ourselves. Um, and if we can actually do that as if you were saying it to another, as if another was saying it to us, um, yeah, I think that that's the process is developing a relationship with yourself where you see yourself as just as precious as anyone else. And that's setting the foundation for every other interaction that you have. Um, and it gives you permission to, to be gentle with yourself. I love that, that. Self-love isn't a destination, it's an everyday journey. And it's not something that you can get and hold on to and put it on your shoulder like a badge. It's something that you have to continuously work on. Well, thanks for uh, sharing that, Minta. Uh, we're down to our last five minutes. And so I'd love to just kind of go around to everyone and uh, maybe share something that stood out to you. And uh, any last thoughts or comments that you have? Kara, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, first, thanks for letting me uh, show up late today. Have a busy morning. Um, really glad to be here. It was just really nice just kind of listening to all the ideas and soaking this in as I start kind of getting ready to head in this direction in my own life. Um, I really loved talking about agreements and and separating our, our emotions from theirs. I think we have this big challenge just in our everyday relationships about um, separating our emotions from others. And I can only imagine that being so much more difficult when this is another young being that is so dependent on you, especially in the early years. And so just I, I loved um, and practice. And I liked, you know, Joshua, with your, you know, story with um, just recently changes with Araya and with the ball and her nighttime routine, and that's a great example of that daily practice and learning, learning from her and learning from, you know, and from you and Laura and your relationship as you go and just rolling with the punches. So, thanks. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thanks, Kara. Erica. So thank you so much, guys, for putting this up. I really love how you explained that, Josh, on the beginning, that uh, like mind, you know, like-minded people getting together and kind of having the support and community to um, to continue the work. I, you know, like you to continue work with my family, but having that, um, you know, having not just me coming up it's like okay well how do i do this and do i am i doing it you know am i doing it right and not being so righteous about like oh i'm doing it right nobody else is get better than you know like that this gonna be but having options and being curious to improve and practice just like it just let you know continuing to grow with this process and um i i love the transparency part where you said that you know like, like just 
talking about like uh, you know uh, situations where oh I left my car my key in the car I would and I was thinking how would I approach it I would say oh silly mummy but really is that what I would want to say do you know what I mean so it really made me think how you know even if I don't say it how would I act and a child will pick up on those vibrations and the energy I would be giving out just kind of made me think about oh wow who am I first in this situation you know in this uh, relationship so thank you so much for bringing that into my vision yeah thanks thanks for being here Julia do you have uh, any last comments to say yeah no it's it's always great to hear other people's input so I really appreciate everyone giving the feedback and talking about it and look forward to the conversations in the future awesome yeah, thanks so much for, for joining us. Minta? Any last uh, gems of yeah. wisdom? I'm just super, yeah, super excited for this. I feel like I'm just in overwhelm mode right now. Kara, I don't know if you had heard, but I'm um, uh, 15 weeks pregnant right now. So I'm, I'm in the process of becoming mom and I'm, I just feel totally overwhelmed with resources for being pregnant and books and this and that and birth and blah, 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 and so much of that. And I feel like I'm nowhere near being able to really like sit down and read books and like study the parenting part. So I'm really loving, um, although I feel like the parents already, it's great like where the responsibility just goes down like wholeheartedly into like, oh, I'm not my own person anymore. Can't eat food for myself. Can't go do anything for myself. Like everything's for this little growing thing. But that's a balance we got to work with too. But I, I just love this resource because it feels really tangible and easy for me to jump in on and start growing these tools, techniques, and experience without having to put a lot of time and effort into it when I've got a plethora of other stuff to do right now before baby becomes an outside experience. Um, yeah, and then the other word that just popped up, I think Erica said it, but I just wanted to leave you all with, is um, curiosity. It's just like curiosity is the best word ever. Maybe better than that. <laughs> um, because it allows us to approach any situation without judgment so it allows us to, to put our opinions behind us and be like hmm, i wonder what's happening here and it we stop being like i know what's happening here and i i had parents like that and it put me in a role of being like i'm going to analyze this and so to switch it to just that curiosity is so powerful and if we can walk in with an attitude of curiosity i think we're doing a damn good job awesome yeah Thank you all for uh, being here. For me, this is really important for me to develop a sense of community that is of like mind uh, and, and one that we can all share our experiences and tools with. So I hope that you're able to join us next month. Gonna stick with uh, the first Thursday of the month uh, around this time. Um, eventually, maybe uh, propose like a quarterly or, uh, or, or once a year or once every six months or so meeting in real places. So maybe this will end up on the playground uh, one day. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited for uh, where this is going to go and, and to continue to learn and, and grow alongside you. So thank you guys for showing up and uh, I hope to see you next time. Wonderful. Thank you, Josh. And one more question. Would you be a guy open in like sharing, like let's say if you have a, a book you're reading and it inspired you or something like that, would that be something somebody would be interested in doing? Or I don't want to bother everybody by saying, hey, can you send me some idea? For, something like that, guys. What do you think? For sure. I, I think uh, with the success of this starting, I'm going to just create a Facebook group. Uh, for us and so we can just throw everything in there and uh, uh, learn and grow side by side Thank you so much just for all your work and energy and commitment. All right. Have a great day guys and see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye, Bye. How do I hang out this thing? <laughs> <laughs>